Hello, and welcome to Writer's Group Therapy. I'm Tom. And I'm Roshni. We're writers helping writers with whatever writing ailments you might have. Whether it's related to your craft or your career, we can help. Are you ready for your session? The The doctors doctors are are in. in. We are so excited to have today's guest with us. You probably know Dennis Lehane for his award-winning novels and the film adaptations they spawned, including Shutter Island, Mystic River, and Gone Baby Gone, or his award-winning TV shows The Wire and Boardwalk Empire. His latest outing is the Taron Egerton True, Co- True Crime Limited series on Apple TV Plus entitled Blackbird. Thanks for being here, Dennis. Well, thanks for having me, guys. Thank you, Dennis. Yeah, uh, this is really exciting. I've watched a few episodes. I can't wait to keep going on it, but this is a really exciting show. But let's wind it back first. How did you get here? We like to know how writers got their start. We know you're a novelist and then became a screenwriter. Uh, how did you start as a novelist and how did you make that transition to, to screenwriting? Um, well, I st- yeah, I started actually as a short story writer. <laughs> that was my big ambition. Um, and then... Uh, about halfway through my 20s, I uh, realized that well, I wrote a novel and um, and I could sometimes spend like a year trying to get a short story right. Uh, I found them agonizing. And then I wrote a novel in three weeks. And it wasn't wow. necessarily How do you that. do it? <laughs> yeah. But what it told me, it, that doesn't speak to the quality of it, believe me, because it needed a lot of work after that first draft. But um the the point was is it came out naturally it felt very natural and i think that's one of the most important questions you need to answer as a writer is um when you're when you're starting out what type of writer am i because i know i know poets who think they're novelists and i know novelists who who like me who thought i was a short story writer and on and on so um i need the sort of gradual unfolding that happens in a novel and I, I discovered the exact same dynamic again when I started to be a screenwriter because writing for television feels very na- natural to me. Writing for film, which is very much like writing a short story, is extremely difficult. Uh, ah, that makes sense. Yeah. I see what you, how that worked out. Yeah. Yeah. So that doesn't mean that I, you know, I, I have a one. I have one screenplay that has been produced, The Drop, which I'm very proud of, but it was difficult, and. Um, uh, whereas writing for television just feels natural. It just feels when you, when I know I'm somewhere within six to 10 episodes, I feel very much at home and very comfortable and, and can understand instinctively how to break those segments down. Uh, uh, in- that kind of answers my, one of my questions was, um, your, your novels were adapted by other people for, for movies, but you've been working, you've been writing in TV. And I was kind of wondering why that happened. And it seems like you found a place where you, like you said, it feels natural. Like you have that longer arc, you can tell longer stories and more, more emotional things over a longer period of time in TV, huh? Yeah. And you can drill down a lot, um, Oh, I can. I should say I can. I think it's very important to do that because what works for me is not necessarily what works for anybody else. And 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 so nothing annoys me more than when I hear artists pontificate as if their way is the only way. Um, that's just about the opposite of what any art is. Is you know, it's, it's very much about who the teller is. Um, yeah, I think that what TV allows me to do in a way that I, I don't feel as comfortable in film, uh, you know, in a compressed two hour t- time limit, is it allows me to just really get expansive in terms of character. It allows me to to drill deep and spread wide. Um, it, it just allows uh, I have the luxury of space to to really examine a person or a multitude of people at the at the sort of depth that I want it, that I would like to. So that's why I, I prefer television. And why, and how, and when did you make that transition? When did you, what was your first uh, introduction to TV writing um, from, you know, was it from one of your novels or was it from uh, an original story idea? I uh, know my first introduction to TV writing was on the wire. And, right. and that, that was, um, 
that was a that was an education that was that was my true grad school and um i had i had written by that point um uh several novels i'd written at least 10 by that point i i knew what i was doing as a novelist and i thought oh this shouldn't be hard and i didn't know what the hell i was doing as a screenwriter i didn't have a clue um i'm i'm ever grateful to david simon and ed burns for keeping me on when they probably should have just fired me uh oh boy yeah you know, uh and they you know they worked with me and they showed me the difference um and show is the key word there you know um there is no there is no place for um interior monologue in television there is no place for uh fat it has to be um you know, stripped to its narrative essence. Uh, you know, that's the first, that's the first law of, of, you know, for lack of a better term, cinematic narrative. Um, so, um, it, it, it had me using completely different muscles and thinking about it in a very different way. I mean, speaking of that, because as you just pointed out, it is two different disciplines of the same thing. Would you consider yourself an author first or a screenwriter first? What, what sort of things besides the, you know, I can't wax poetic about a monologue here, but, you know, other things did you learn as you were transitioning and putting on the different hats? Well, I'll give you a perfect example. It, it's the difference between a novel and a, and, a, and a movie. And this doesn't come from, I didn't do this. This was Ben Affleck did it. Um, Gone Baby Gone ends about the same way. Um, it is the, the hero has done what he has done um, for the right reasons and everything has turned out wrong. And in the book, he sits in a playground and he ruminates on it. And it's, and it's an interior monologue that lasts, I think, about four pages. And that's the ending of the book. In the film, he goes and he sits with the child he has, quote, saved, end quote. And they watch TV. And it's a beautiful image. And it's image versus interior monologue. They're, they're both the same point. But... Ben Affleck couldn't do a scene where a guy sits in a playground and thinks. And I wasn't thinking like a screenwriter at that point. I was thinking like a novelist and I wanted to do a scene where a guy sits in a playground thinks. So those are the two different versions of the exact same moment. But one is cinematic and one is literary. How's the, how is the mental state you have to be in when you're writing TV versus working on a novel? Is, that, is there, a, I mean, besides the technical side of it, do you have a different mental uh, state you're in or something like that? Completely. When I, yeah. With a novel, you're granular. You're all the way in it. You're literally swimming. You are those characters. You're swimming through that world. With with a script, you're kind of flying above it or floating above it in a hot air balloon. And, and you're showing it. So you can, when I write a novel, nine times out of 10, I have to write it as close to the sleeping state as I can. I need to get up and get right to my desk. And I need to have complete tunnel vision and focus. That's not conducive to being a social human being. It's not conducive to being a parent, um, which I am. And I started to fall into television at a, at a more extreme level right around the time my kids reached school age and it was perfect because i can get up make my kids breakfast drive them to school come back and work on a script a novel that would be blown to hell i mean i'd, I'd lose i would literally lose the plot i would lose my connection to the material by the time i got back from dropping them at school so do you find that um you know, a novel you're writing by yourself and on a TV show, you're working with a, you know, a team of writers. You might be working on an episode by yourself, but you've got a more uh, collaborative environment. Do you find that helpful? I love it. I absolutely yeah. love it. Yeah. As long as you're working with the right people, you know, everything, when we went and did Blackbird, you know, we were in Southern Louisiana. Um, we had COVID outbreaks. We had lightning strikes almost daily. We had, um, we had a hurricane. We had, we had ungodly heat. We had so many things go wrong, as any film production does. We had just so many things go wrong. And yet, at the on the worst possible day, I was as happy as I've ever been in my life. And part of it was because 
when everything went wrong, you had people to talk through it with. When everything goes wrong in a novel, you are on your own. You are in the valley of darkness and you, you know, you will get out or you will not get out all on your own. Roshni has some experience with that. <laughs> yeah, poor Tom. My first novel, he was my editor. I think we had 17 drafts. So, Ooh, yeah. oh, my God. Um, <laughs> so yeah, he was very patient. <laughs> the number of people I know. Look, here's the thing. And this is what so many people don't don't realize how brutal it is. You're writing a novel. And always the middle of a novel is a nightmare. You know, it's just, mm -hmm. it's, it's acknowledged among all novelists. The middle is hell because all of those wonderful ideas that you had in the first flush of execution, that first draft in, in the first act, um, all of a sudden you'll get into the second half of the book and you'll, you'll be forced to understand where you made massive miscalculations. You know, D uh, David Mamet has a great line. The problems of the second act are the problems of the first act. Mm. There are things you didn't realize. Mm -hmm. So now you're in the second act and you don't know what you're doing. And your whole novel is falling apart on you. And everything in the world is telling you to quit. And seasoned, seasoned novelists push their way through. And sometimes they're still wrong. Sometimes they shouldn't have. And you never know. You simply never know. That's the true horror of a book. <laughs> to be honest with you. Have you ever had to like leave a, a book you're working on for like months or years and then come back to it? Never, never, never happened. I never I did that. One. Okay. No, I, I, I will tell you, I left one once. Uh, I left one and said, I can't wait to come back to this. And every time I came back to it since, I was like, yeah, no, this doesn't work. It was wow. the one book I quit and I was right to quit it. Wow. Um, and, and every year further away from it, I go, wow, that was really bad. Where when I walked away from it, I was like, this is the greatest thing I've ever written. How come I can't make it? Oh, wow. <laughs> you know? Um, so it's, um, and that's why I do, you know, I, I speak a lot about this and more so now that I work in TV. Um, I think the most dangerous thing in the world for a writer is, is preciousness, is, is being too... Um, the, uh, of confusing the two egos. There's the ego of the work, and that is extremely important, and you should have a very big one. Um, and then there's the ego of the self, and that should be very small. That should be Zen, um, and always in service of the of the big picture, because it's not about you. And if it becomes about you, then then your your work will suffer, and you so will your mental health. That's actually a really good uh, transition into something we wanted to ask you about, because we noticed you have several novels that have been adapted into film. And yeah. I know you mentioned earlier, writing for film is not your favorite. You'd rather write for TV. But were you also just too close to the work? And that's why you didn't do the adaptation? Because you adapted Blackbird. Yeah. So what happened? <laughs> well, adapting my own work for many years was very hard. I couldn't do it. I couldn't see it. Um, and, and I needed to get my 10,000 hours as a screenwriter before I could really feel comfortable, you know, knowing that I could adapt my own work. Um, but Mr. Griver is a perfect example. Mr. Griver was like hot off the press when Clint Eastwood came for it. Like it was literally, I think it had been out for a week. And so when Brian Helgeland went to adapt it, um, I think the book had now been on the shelves for, I don't know, two months. And I was so close to it. I'd lived with that book for two and a half years. And potentially one could argue had lived with it for 10 years before that, that I wouldn't know what to throw out. And you have to throw out 80% of a book. I, I wouldn't have had any clue how to do it. And studying what Brian did with it, Brian Helgeland did with it, showed me once again, the difference between the literary and the image driven. So the first 37 pages of Mystic River is still probably the best writing I've ever done. And it's, very much about them as boys. And it's about really the 1970s in Boston, which I have a very vivid, strong sense of because I was a little kid. And um, and it's almost all internal. And it's about the loss of innocence. And Brian had to get that into an image. He had to get that. And he came up with this idea of the kids drawing their names in cement. 
I never would have thought of that. And I might think of it now, but I wouldn't have thought about it, you know, 18 years ago. And Brian's image of them drawing their names in the cement. And then one of them is halfway through when the police show up. Well, that's the last shot you ever see in the film as well. And it's, it's that his childhood is cut off right there. He never finishes writing his name. And that's the brilliance of a screenwriter. That's image over wordplay. Cool. Yeah, that's pretty deep, actually. These stories, these kind of gritty real life type of stuff, the true crime, you know, you've got your um, the, the wire, the boardwalk empire, and now Black Blackbird, um, which is another true crime because it's based on a, actually the novel of the main character Jimmy Keen. No, it's not a novel; it's um, a memoir. It's a it's a it's oh, it's a memoir. A yes. Memoir called yeah. in, in with the Devil. Yeah, in the Jimmy Keen's memoir. What what is it about this genre that you find so compelling? You, you seem to keep coming back to this crime and these dark uh, these people who are you know actually one of the things we want to ask about was. How do you write a character who's the, the quote unquote hero who's really not likable? <laughs> he's, charming, he's charming, but he's not a he's, good, he's not a good guy. No, he doesn't start out that way. And it's no, it's a journey for Jimmy. Jimmy has to go on a journey. I, I, I like to say that this story is about a guy who becomes a far better person, but a far more damaged human being. You know that that there is a price to what happens. You know what with the journey he goes on. And one is it just it makes him a far better person. But the other thing is he's a he's a he's a shell of himself earlier because he was much more. What's the buzzword these days? Performative. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, he was he was living the life of a of a very cocky, uh, callow young man. And 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 it, and, it caught, and it caught up to him, chased him down and caught up to him. And then he was asked to do something that was, you know, um, extraordinary in every way shape and form and that is you know this is a true story in the inspired by a true story certainly and the and the and the stuff that jimmy keen did with larry hall in that prison um is in the main is in the macro completely true it's you know the details of how he got there that's that's things i i had to create but um so why am i attracted to darkness um i'm really not i didn't want to do this project <laughs> I didn't want to. really. Yeah, originally I turned it down. I, I I was like, I don't want to go to prison. I just spent you know years working in you know Mr. Mercedes and and the Outsiders, Stephen King world, very dark. Um, and but I started to think about telling a a very mythological story, which you know this is this is very this follows the clean lines of of you know the oldest mythological stories, Gilgamesh. You know, I mean, this is a guy who is. It was sent out um, to protect his society, which is to get the name to to get a man to confess to murders that he did, so that he can't do more of them. Um, and he has to do, journey far, and he has to go into a deep dark cave, and he has to confront a monster, and he has to come back out a changed man. That's that's the story. And um, I was very attracted to that. I was very attracted to looking at. Um, these concepts of toxic masculinity and misogyny that are now running rampant in our society. Um, and uh, I, I really, uh, there was a moment that uh, I think was very instructive in that there's a moment where Larry says something, and this was, this was recorded as fact in the book. And it was so horrible that I was listening to the book on tape that I had to pull my car to the side of the road and just take a minute. And when Paul Walter Hauser read that part in a table read for the first time, he broke down crying. And uh, that was the final hook. And I can't say what that is because it doesn't come until the sixth episode. But spoiler. I know. No, I can't do a spoiler on that one. But the, the, there were just moments. There were things in the story that made me say, I, I think I can tell an extremely compelling story that, that, a, that a savvy viewer will pull even more from. You know, I don't like to write the what I call do your homework and eat your vegetables type of drama. That's not my job. But I do like to to have um, a thematic richness in all the things I do. And I think this 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 has it. Oh, it's thick. It's it's very um, it's it's a 
you know, this is Apple TV plus. So you've got a lot of leeway, you know, it's not broadcast. Yep. You know, and uh, and now you get to tell these stories and you don't have to be as concerned about length and you can really pace it out how you like it. Do you find working for for uh, like a, a streamer like Apple TV Plus different from working for like a network or a you know, cable network or something like that? Well, I've never worked for network TV. I wouldn't know what to do. I've never it's ri- always been cable. Yeah, I've, I've never written to a commercial in my life. The first time somebody said that to me, I was 10 years into my writing career and I was like, what does that mean? The <laughs> jaw dropped. They were like, what? You've never written to commercial. I'm like, I don't, I don't know what that is. And yeah, it, it really does feel more cinematic. Like even, even though it's broken into episodes, it doesn't have that those the beats of a TV show. It has more of a uh, of a long movie type feel to it. Yeah, and that's what I love. That's what I love. Feels like a novel. And uh, yeah, and I will never ever. I I've had an offer. I once had a very serious offer to work for network TV, and I was like, guys, you don't want me. They were like, no, we really do. And I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> you just, uh, and um, they think they want you. Yeah, they think they want me. And then they'd be like, what are you doing? Um, so, well, you've got, I mean, you've got these awards for, you know, some of, you know, I'm always told The Wire, you know, everyone always talks about The Wire as being like one of the, the best written shows like ever. It's It's very common to hear that. That's kind of hard to live up to, isn't it? Well, you know what it is, though, is that they, you know, that, that we've been working steadily ever since. It's been a joy for all of us who were on that show that nobody watched when it was on. But, um, but we, you know, we, it, it is that. It's like, guys, do you, you know, when people say to me, you know, we, 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 again, that conversation about when somebody came to me and tried to get me to work for network, it was like, they were like, well, we love The Wire. I'm like, yeah, but you wouldn't show The Wire. You wouldn't do the wire. There's no way you'd do the wire. And they're like, well, yeah, but we want that wire feel. Well, you can't. <laughs> you can't get it. You know what I mean? It's not that Barton Fink feel. You can't get it um, without committing to what HBO committed to with the wire, which was an extremely low rated show that that they just allowed us to do. We, the joke was because they didn't have anything to replace, to replace us with. But that's not true. But it, it, it had that feel because we were not. Nobody knew we were even on um, until the fifth season. So, um, no, I like, I love my little space. I love, I love working with Apple TV plus they treated this entire production with, I, I mean, I've never seen commerce treat art so well, which is, you know, it's the battle between art and com- commerce when you work and they, they were so supportive and, um, they they really were they, they they gave us just they gave us wonderful notes they were smart they were intelligent um and they allowed me to cast the entire show which wow which was you know without you know we i strongly wanted an actress who is not particularly well known seasoned but not well known to play the one female lead because i wanted her to bring no baggage or history to the part so that the audience would be as, as um, kind of on their toes with her as Jimmy was. Um, and, and I, I hired Sepeda Moafi and, and I told Apple, this is who I want expecting major pushback. And they were like, yeah, she's great. Did the show running come to you kind of naturally, or was that something you, you really had to learn as well? I, I built up to it. I think, you know, I, I ran um, the writer's side of uh, of Mr. Mercedes for two seasons. Um, so I was I was handling the sort of L.A. side of that show. Nothing on location. And uh, that was a good that was a good way to get my feet wet without being thrown all the way in. So by the time we did this, I was pretty familiar with most most aspects of production. Cool. Do you think um, writers who are, you know, kind of like on the fence, like, uh, should I write a novel? Should I write a, a screenplay? Should I write a pilot? Where do you think now that you've written, you've, well, you've written novels and, and, and t- television and you've, you've did, you've done film actually as well. Do you, do you think that there's a best place to start? No, I, I, I agree with what I said earlier, which is, you know, who are you as a writer? You need to, you need to do the thing that you're comfortable with mm-hmm. because it's too friggin' hard. I mean, it's just too hard otherwise. So, you know, 
again, this person I know, or this, this writer I know who, who tried to be a novelist, one of the best poets I ever saw. And, and he would say, well, you know, well, there's no money in poetry. Well, right. But there's no money in novels either. If you don't write a good one, you know, good point. Yeah. And, and it was like, you know, you're, you're trying to be, you're trying to just get a tenure track. You're not trying to be rich. Like I don't, I could never understand it. And it was just, he wanted to write novels because I think he thought that's the ultimate prestige. So, um, it was, you know, I've, I've seen that and I've seen that with, I, I know a guy who's now a terrific screenwriter who thought for years he was a novelist. And, and it was like, you, you, then you'd see him write something in script form and you'd be like, oh no, that's really good. <laughs> that's, that's exceptional. You know, that's what's missing from your novels. So um, it's just, you got to find out what type of writer you are. And the only way to do that is to try the different things. Would you say it's, Easier or harder to pitch to a publisher versus like an agent slash, you know, production company, basically. Oh, you don't, you don't really pitch to publishers. I mean, maybe oh. in the New World Order you do. But mostly what you do is you send them a manuscript. You send an agent a manuscript. You land your agent with a manuscript and then they go pitch it to a publisher. They're the pitchers. That's what an agent is. Um, so. But again, so much has changed since I started and I, I keep my head down. I don't engage um, in the publishing world, almost anything except the writing of the book. I just think that's, that's, that's my lane. So um, Blackbird is on Apple TV plus and uh, it's limited series. So it's not going to have a second season as far as I know. No. Uh, so what do you, what do you have planned going forward? Um, uh, the next thing I'm doing, or at least trying to do, or attempting, is um, a TV show for Apple TV Plus based on a podcast. Uh, really? Yeah. Mm. And it's, uh, um, yeah, it's a very intriguing story. I can't speak to exactly what it is right now, but um, ah, it's a very intriguing secret. story. So it's also in the, you know, the true crime genre. If that's where I got to live for a little while, it's fine. <laughs> I can mess with my themes. And then um, after that, I very much want to do um, an adaptation of my next novel for television. Ah, so now you're going to dip into that. Yes. Okay. And awesome. my next novel is about um, the uh, busing crisis in Boston in the 1970s. Oh, wow. wow. That's it. That's what I got. Oh, cool. <laughs> and if people want to find you online, how can they do so? They can't. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> I have no social media presence. I have, uh, my 10 year old said to my wife the other day, he was just like, daddy and devices, they just don't go together. <laughs> <laughs> I just hate that's when you asked me to figure out how to mute my computer is perfect example. I, um, I am not. Do you have a website? <laughs> There's a website that somebody else um, uh, maintains. And uh, ah. I think I'm actually on Twitter. One of my daughters told me I'm on Twitter. Oh, <laughs> okay. surprise. Yeah. But I don't. Someone's pretending to be you. <laughs> uh, there's somebody, yeah. There's somebody who, like works for the publishing house who, who like drops like things. And, and I got a lot of followers. She's like, Dad, you got a ton of followers. And I'm, and I'm always telling her, you know, because she's 12. My older one is almost 13. So she's all about social media. Mm. And, I have a feeling uh, your publicist is going to tell us to cut some of this. <laughs> I know, sorry, uh, but I'm out there somewhere. Um, yeah, but yes, uh, but otherwise, no. I like to again. I like to know I'm I'm old school enough, and I'm old enough to have established my lane before all this stuff came along. So, I like my my lane is to just do the creation creating part, and sales and self promotion. That's somebody else's job. I, think uh, I wish it was ideal. that easy for, for <laughs> us. Yeah. Just everyone's ideal. Awesome. Yes. Thank you so much, Dennis, for coming Thank on. You Thank yeah, you guys. Yeah, thanks. It's really interview. interesting. And I love the show. I can't wait to watch the rest of it. And uh, we'll look forward to your next uh, project. That sounds great. Thank you guys so much. You have a great day. Me too. Thank you. Bye.